This is Making Comics 101, issue 20, Pitching. <music> Greetings, people of the internet. I'm Scott with Circworks Art Labs. Welcome, mad creators, to the underground laboratory where together we're going to create some awesome comics because this is Making Comics 101. Uh, issue 21, we're talking about pitching today. Contrary to the little intro that I did, this has nothing to do with baseball, not that kind of pitching. We're talking about pitching your ideas, letting people know what you're working on, getting people excited about what you're working on. So, you know, maybe that will help you get a publisher or break into the business. Now, there are different roads that people take to quote unquote break into the business. You may want to go the self publishing route, you may want to present your work to a publisher that's going to publish your work. And we'll kind of dive into some of the different aspects of those, uh, depending on how you want to do that. But it's been said before that once somebody breaks into the business, you know, they find an entryway, a door to break in. Once they do that, then that door is boarded up and no one can go in that same route. And in some ways that's, a, that's true. I, I think there's a lot of best practices, things that you should be doing no matter what, but everyone has a different story of how they broke into the business or how they got work or you know how they got their book published. So there, it's, it's really hard to sum up and say, take these steps, do this, and that will help you break into the business because unfortunately, it's not that easy. I wish that it was, but it's not. But like I said, there's some things that you can do that are going to help you because although there's not one right way to do that, there are definitely a lot of wrong ways and you want to avoid those wrong ways. So first off, I want to talk about submissions. So submissions are just that, work that you submit to a publisher in an effort to get published. So what do you submit? Well, you submit samples, but what kind of samples do you submit? I guess it depends on what aspect of creating comics you're interested in or is your forte, whether if you're an illustrator, if you're a penciler or an inker, if you're a storyteller or if you're a writer. It all depends on what quote unquote job or position you want in the comic book industry. So me primarily I'm an artist although I do write my own stuff and I you know full disclosure it's been a while since I submitted anything to a major publisher uh, in the beginning way back in the 90s I did that I'll show you some of the samples and things that I submitted now I made a lot of mistakes and I'm gonna point out some of those mistakes I might have got a few things right but again this was a long time ago so things have changed a lot of things have changed but I think what is a good practice back then more or less is still a fairly good practice now as far as what people are looking for but in addition to being an artist I also write my own stuff uh, I wouldn't necessarily present myself as a comic book writer but I do write my own stuff I create my own books and everything and I enjoy the writing process I've got a little bit of experience with both although I've never presented myself solely as just a writer so like I said my experience with submitting artwork goes way back to the 90s and comic the industry was a lot different back then there were the kind of comics that were published was a lot different the amount of books that were selling was a lot different the demand for new artists and illustrators was very high right now there are so many people I mean the competition is just you know it's incredible as far as the amount of brilliant artists out there that you're basically competing with to get these jobs so it's not it's not so easy as just submitting something. I mean, and this is a tactic and this is something that you should do, but just submitting your artwork what, either via email or through the mail or whatever, it's gonna end up in this slush pile with a bunch of other artists. So your stuff has to stand out. If it doesn't, I mean, it's just, there's so many awesome art that artists out there and, and relatively, I mean, there's a lot of comic books out there as well, but, you know the ratio is a little bit in favor of not or not in favor of the artist or the creator now back when I was a little kid wanting to get into comics and obviously I was nowhere even near skilled enough I was you know sitting on my bedroom floor drawing comics dreaming of someday being published by Marvel or DC this was the way to do it back then uh, this is the Mar official Marvel tryout book uh, this is one of the ways I don't know if DC had an equivalent to this but Basically, it's a pretty cool book. You know, it is in the standard uh, format for American comics, the, the format that you draw at. As far as this 11 by 17, of course, that would be reduced to a standard comic book size. But this is the first time I was even aware. I mean, I'm drawing on the back of, you know, back then I'm drawing on the back of 
uh, like copy paper or my homework assignments from school drawing my comics and if you look at all my old comics you can flip it over and you can see you know little math equations and problems that I'm supposed to be solving but I'm drawing instead and that's why I'm not very good at math. But anyway, what this book provided was a sample script. It's got sample pages that if you're an inker, you can ink, blank pages that if you're a penciler, and that's something to keep in mind, like I said before, what you're trying to do as far as what you want to do, whether you want to be a penciler or an inker. If you want to be a penciler, but you also ink, but your main goal is to be a penciler, you probably want to show the pencils and not necessarily the inks because the editor may look at that and say, oh, this guy's a great anchor and you know that is attack that is a way you can maybe break in as an anchor and then move to doing pencils however if you get a job as this fantastic anchor they might not want you to do pencils they want you to keep doing inks now you know the industry is very it's it's based on freelance work so even once you break in the sad thing is once you break into the comic book industry it's not like once you're in you're in you are constantly re-breaking in for the most part if you're on a popular book and it gets canceled, you're out of a job. This isn't, you're not on staff at a Marvel or DC. You are a freelance artist, illustrator, writer, and you're only, <laughs> you're only as employed as your current job. So even if you are in the industry, now once you do quote unquote break in, you have a better chance of, I mean, you've got stuff that you can show to further that career. But if the comic book industry and most, businesses, whatever it is, especially if you're doing freelance, is all about relationships and building relationships and meeting people. And sometimes as creative people, as artists, we're a little bit more introverted and that's hard for us. Now there are other ways we can, you know, kind of subvert that and do use different tactics to sort of break in. We'll talk a little bit more about that next week when we go into marketing. Do your best to try to be personal, try to meet people, try to find common ground with people and just spark up relationships, whether it's online, on Twitter, whether it's at a convention and try to be somebody that's memorable, that they're going to remember so that they will give your book a second look or your pages or whatever you're presenting. So as an artist, what do you want to submit? I know we all like to make draw these awesome full panel spreads, these splash pages, pinups. These are all really fun things to draw, but the idea of working in the comic book industry, it's all about visual storytelling. So you have to show that you can tell a story. Now you can sort of tell a story in a pinup, but you have to go further. You have to show sequential art. Most people don't hire people to do cover work right off the bat. Say, if I want to be a cover artist and I submit a bunch of cover art, that's typically not what they're looking for. They're looking for sequential art. So I'm going to show you some samples. And again, these go way, way back. And as I said, this is back in the 90s. People were looking for some different things and I made some mistakes in doing this. And please do not judge me by my past art. But so this is typically you know a three to four page story uh, this is just basically a story I came up with now a lot of publishers right now will have a sample script that they would like you to work off of there are different publishers wanting maybe with different sample scripts maybe you don't want to cater your work to each particular publisher but that's also you know going that little extra mile using the characters for a particular publisher it's going to make them feel a little more special if you're using their characters for instance if i'm submitting my marvel characters to dc a certain editor may look past this and know that this is just a big industry and they're just using these characters if you can mix up different characters i've done that on some of my submissions as i'll show you just so you can submit the same thing to you know different publishers that might be a way to go but I think an editor will take a second look if you're using their particular characters or maybe just characters that don't exist in anything maybe your own original characters that are a little more nondescript so having said that this is uh, this was my first submission that I did this is a character uh, from image comics pit and He's basically battling Spawn right here. And as you can see, I'm showing some, I mean, the first one is a splash page. I mean, you can have some of that, uh, but then, but it does go into a story and you know, you've got this basically a just big brawl. But the problem with this is almost all you're seeing here is figures. I mean, obviously there are some backgrounds you can see perspective and that is something that you want to show that you can handle perspective. But you also want to show like, quiet moments. I mean, back in the 90s, this was, I mean, most comics were, you know, pretty much action. Uh, that's what people are looking for. Nowadays, they want quiet character building moments and things. And you have to show that you can set up a, a, a sort of this generic scene. 
and make it look interesting as well as these battles. If you can show things that most people aren't showing, whether if you can show how you can draw animals, because that is a weak point for a lot of people, perspective, backgrounds, anything that you can draw well besides just the figure. I mean, you need to show that you can do great anatomy. That goes without saying, but not just human anatomy. Like I said, animals, uh, a lot of people have problems drawing that, even kids. Uh, a lot of people can't draw kids well. Different people can't draw certain genders as well as other genders. So, you know, you want to show your strong points, but really if you're going to be a comic book artist, you have to be good at all these things because when you get a script, you have to know how to draw that. Whether you're you're at the point where you can, if you don't, if you've never drawn it before, you can look for reference and figure out a way to do that, but you're going to be asked to draw all kinds of things. Drawing comics isn't just about drawing superheroes and cool poses. There's more to it than that. Whether you can show that you can draw a room and a lampshade and a couch and all this kind of stuff. Um, you need to show those type of things. And you need to show something original or something that's going to make the editor stop and take notice. Doing something that's either out of the ordinary, that's something they haven't seen before. This is the kind of stuff that editors are looking for. Now, as you can see with this, there's all kinds of extraneous lines, and I was just trying to do my best image impersonation back in the days. But then I wanted to sort of hone my skills a little better. I got rid of some of those lines, concentrate a little more on the, the figure, and I basically take this, took the same story again and uh, this time uh, submitting to, uh, I think this is a DC submission. I sort of replace uh, Pitt with Lobo here. He's kind of jumping in. Another thing real quick, uh, just to let you know, uh, on the back I've got my address and everything. So it doesn't hurt to put this on every page because you never know if whatever other information you're sending with this is going to get lost. So it always helps to put the, your information here, whether it's a website, whether it's your address, or whatever the case. Uh, definitely have those on, on the back of each page and your name and all that kind of stuff. I basically took this same design and reworked it with Batman and Lobo here. So I was constantly trying to improve uh, my skills as I go and that's the other thing. Once you submit work, if you don't hear back anymore, submit wo more work and submit your best work. Don't just keep submitting the same thing, you know, whatever you're improving on. Because people, an editor, if you can if you can get to a point where, whether it's finding any sort of common ground or in conversation or whatever that correspondence is, if there's something they can remember you by and they can see that improvement, that's going to help as well. Now, I've done other submissions. This was a submission I did to Dark Horse. I really wanted, at one point, wanted to work on Star Wars, so I've got sort of a further advantage adventure of sort of a Star Wars using some uh, well-known characters, some original characters, but most of these are three-page stories. I've got establishing shots. I'm showing some of the spaceships. I'm showing some backgrounds. I'm showing different poses. Uh, you know, whether this is great work or not, I mean, this was a long time ago, but I'm constantly working at it. Now, when you send out submissions, I was sending submissions out to a lot of people, and it gets frustrating because you're getting rejections and rejections, and that's sort of disheartening. But the thing is, one of the tips I like to give people is try to make it into a game where if you can collect those uh, rejection letters, you know, put those, use those with pride. That is something that you send out there in the world, and even if it got rejected, I mean, the fact that even somebody responded and gave you a letter, that's awesome. So I used to c collect all my rejection letters and almost like a game like how many rejection letters I can get so it's almost like a win-win situation if you get another rejection it's just it's it's a, another badge of honor that you can pin up but if you get an acceptance letter then it's also a win it's a bigger win so try to that's just sort of a little hack that I like to tell people but you know when you're sending your submissions out sometimes you will get an acceptance letter so I I got some acceptance letter from some, some smaller companies or some upstart companies and things like that None of them really panned out. I had one smaller company, you know, send back, oh, we love your samples and everything. We're working on this book. We'd like you to sort of try out for it. And this is something that I personally wouldn't really recommend doing because comics don't pay a lot. And you should at least be getting something if you're asked to work on pages, some sort of a page rate. But back then I was more young and naive and I'm like, oh, cool, they want to publish a book. So they sent me a small sample script. They wanted me to do another three pages just with their characters. So, you know, I don't know. But anyway, so I did this one. This is some independent thing. It was some kind of biker, Nazi hunter, neo-Nazi hunter type guy. Uh, so he's kind of rolling in. I did this and then, you know, I, and I did some sequential art, submitted 
it and of course they said they love it and not, nothing happened the, the comic book company either folded or they weren't funded enough but they got some it, not publishable but they got some free work out of me so uh, not something I would recommend doing because in my opinion I mean if I was to put myself in a position of an editor if if I can see that somebody can draw it doesn't matter what I ha it sh they should be able to draw whatever. I don't need to see them draw, you know, if I can see they can draw humans or whatever or all this different stuff, I, they, I don't need to see them draw my characters yet. Now, obviously, once I give them a page rate and start working on a comic, uh, you know, there may be some tweaks and things like that. But you should be able to show that you can draw from your initial samples without having to go back and doing these tests and things like that. At least that's my opinion. That may be controversial. That may be contrary to what you know the industry says. But you know, I'm kind of about getting paid for your work. At least something. <laughs> but as I mentioned, and here's another example. So I, I showed you this, and I also did an inking sample. Uh, so if you are, like I said, if you want to be an inker, send inks. If you want to be a penciler, show pencils. If you want to be a writer, you know, show your script. Or, or a sample. Now all that art I showed you was original art. I didn't submit the original artwork. I made photocopies. Nowadays you can make a nice color copy. Uh, back in the days when you try to photocopy, you know, in black and white photocopy pencils, they don't, didn't always come out great. But now you can get, you know, cheaply nice photocopies that are going to look exactly like the real thing. You could even put them on board and make them like on a, on a heavier like cardstock and make them look like actual pages and, you know, even have some of the blue lines showing through. So it's almost indistinguishable but never send original artwork because it's either going to get thrown out it's not going to get returned to you even we, we used to I used to send self-addressed stamp envelopes and I never got any of that stuff back but I never sent originals anyway but I don't even know why I did that maybe if they were going to respond via mail so they wouldn't have to pay for a stamp which still might be a good idea but you could probably just put a little thing but most people if you put your email on I think they're going to respond via email most people are going to take the time to send a letter I don't know maybe and that goes back to those rejection letters I don't know if they're actually sending physical rejection letters they may so it wouldn't hurt to put just a little self-addressed stamp envelope just for that if they use it great if they don't well they don't but these printed samples of pages aren't the only way that you can present your work. Nowadays with print on demand, we can self-publish books. I mean, just think how powerful it is if you're trying to pitch to somebody either at a convention or whatever, if you can send them an actual book. I mean, this says so much. It says that, hey, I can com not only can I sit down and draw three awesome pages, and get those to you. I can complete a thing, I can publish it, I can put it out there, and that says a lot because really one of the major parts of you know being a comic book artist, writer, or whatever is to be able to deliver and deliver on time. You could be the greatest artist in the world, but if you can't put your work out on a timely basis, you are not going to be able to stay employed in the industry. So I talked a lot about you know submitting artwork, usually using characters that people all know, but what if you want to publish your own stuff? And there are companies out there that do publish creator-owned work. Uh, Image Comics, one of the biggest comic book publishers, that's all they publish is creator-owned work. They don't have their own line of characters or anything like that so they only want to see your original ideas another a comic book publisher that that only does creator own stuff is alterna comics you know and that's back in the days that's what I wanted to do I mean there was a small stint where I'm like I'll oh, be cool to draw spider-man and I submitted stuff like that but eventually I started getting in, getting into my own ideas and everything and I wanted to sell my own stuff now I have had some experience doing this in the television and film area mostly children's television and the way we sold ideas in that industry was using a pitch Bible. And I found that this was somewhat successful. And I think, still think it's a way that you can approach some of these companies that are looking for original ideas. And so this is the pitch Bible for a book that I never finished called Retrofits. It, it takes place in the 70s. It's about this teenage pop group that mysteriously disappear off the face of the earth. And then they sort of wake up and realize they're in the future and they've got these awesome powers. And it's sort of a character out of place, out of time story. So that's this book right here and to sum it up I basically this is the pitch bible I've got the little a uh, uh, real quick uh, a little more than a log line which we will talk about um, I've got there's a contents that tells what you're gonna get here I've got little character bios what else uh, issue I got synopsis for each issue this was a mini series I've got a sample script in here and then towards the end I've got my sample pages in here and then in the back, I've just got information about myself with contact information and all that stuff. 
So this uh, this is what I presented. Now it doesn't have to be bound like this. You could probably do, I, although I think it would help because things tend to get passed around and lost. So you know this might be a way to help. And I, I mean I think. I've never submitted to Image or Alterna, but I think this is something that they're going to be looking for because it's got everything that they basically want. And you can go online and find out what different companies are looking for. And that leads me to another point is know what these companies are looking for. You probably don't want to send your horror comics or whatever to like uh, graphics, scholastic. You may not want to send your young adult stuff to Marvel, although I think they do have a young adult line. But know the kind of comic books they publish. You know, Marvel and DC are mostly superheroes. They're probably not looking for a lot of slice of life stuff, whereas other companies might be. There are some companies like Image that are pretty much open to anything, although you also have to kind to pay attention to what's in the zeitgeist. Comic book companies are in this business to hopefully make a profit. So if if they don't think your book will sell, they're probably not going to take it on. I mean, and it's weird stuff. Like I remember a period of time where Disney would not look at anything that had to do with Mars because they released, you know, John Carter, uh, Warrior of Mars, the movie or whatever. I think it was just called John Carter. And then they had another, I forgot what it was. It was something like my stepmother from Mars or something like that. I don't remember. But just because those two movies bombed they said oh the reason they bombed was because it had to do with Mars not not anything with a story not anything with anything else that had to do with Mars which is ridiculous but these are how these companies think so you may have a great idea and for whatever reason if something else came along that didn't do well uh, then they might just pass on it or if you're doing something that just happens to be something that's big right then they make you take you on so also pay attention to sort of what's going on uh, as far as is your comic book something that a particular publisher might be interested in that particular time Okay, we've touched on submitting art samples. Maybe you're not an artist, or maybe you are an artist, but you have a finished book. How do you, you've already got it published and everything, so how do you let people know about it? Say if you're at a convention, or if you're at a, a comic book store, and you want this store to carry your books or whatever, how do you get people on board? How do you pitch that book? Whether it's a story or a finished book, you need an elevator pitch. An elevator pitch, or sometimes also referred to as a log line, is a quick, short, and to the point synopsis of your story. And when I say short, I mean short. I mean, the idea of an elevator pitch is you have the amount of time it takes from get to one floor to another in an elevator to pitch your idea to somebody. If your pitch cannot be summed up in a single tweet, it's probably not an effective pitch. Something you want to remember is this, and it's very important, is that you are not trying to tell your story, you're trying to sell your story, and there is a big difference. Everyone's got awesome stories, everyone's got all these cool characters, and this fantastic lore behind it. You've got all these bizarre names for your characters, and these magic systems, or whatever the case is, that's all cool stuff, but that's not stuff that goes in your elevator pitch. Your elevator pitch is not the time for like world building or techno babble or expanding on your lore and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you're just you're trying to get the point. You're trying to get people on board. You're trying to get them excited. And a common misconception is that an elevator pitch is just an abbreviated version of your story. Like if you've ever turned over a DVD and they've got the little synopsis on the back, that is not an elevator pitch. Let's take Star Wars for instance. One of the things probably right off the bat you want to do is establish the, the genre, what your story is about. You want to make this familiar to people who don't have any idea what your world is like. So you don't, you probably don't even want to, you know, mention names and things of your characters because they're just not familiar with those characters unless maybe you're doing something that's based on like something in the public domain like a Sherlock Holmes or something like that. So an effective log line for Star Wars would be this. A sci-fi fantasy about a spirited young farm boy who discovers mystical powers hidden within himself and teams up with an old wizard, a space pirate, and a feisty princess and together they lead a ragtag rebellion against the Galactic Empire. That basically, now there's a lot of other stuff in Star Wars, I realize that. I mean, we didn't even mention the droids who, you know, that's who we see first off. We don't even meet Luke Skywalker until probably like 30 minutes into the film. You might not even need to mention the other people that he meets along the way. Now, now as I mentioned, I didn't say Luke Skywalker, I didn't say Han Solo, I didn't say Obi-Wan Kenobi or Princess Leia. Uh, I just used descriptors because people don't necessarily know what those are. In some situations, you can say the name of the character if it has some relevance 
relevance or whatever the case. In mine, I actually do for a particular reason, and I'll get to that. But that's not as important as just describing what these characters are to somebody who has no idea. So that's a really good example of what a elevator pitch or log line would be like for Star Wars, but that's not the only way you can go about this. The most important thing you have to think about is you're trying to spark interest. You're trying to get people excited. Something that people have not heard before. If I'm trying to get people to want to know more, and before I even go into a pitch, I might just put out like a, this, a just a, a what if scenario, like uh, just something to, to kind of reel them in a little bit. So for my comic book, Young and the Dead, I might say something like, imagine if you were 11 years old and you woke up one morning to find that all the adults in your neighborhood ter had turned into flesh-eating zombies. So that you know that's something that like oh that that's interesting uh and then from there i can go a little further when trying to get people interested in your comic book familiarity is a big factor so one of the tactics that a lot of movie studios do and i borrow this and a lot of people in comic books or any uh, pitching scenario do this as well where they'll take two things that people are familiar with and that have to do with your comic and put those together so usually the first thing that i say when i'm pitching my comic books is it's a kids versus zombie story. Imagine Goonies meets Night of Living Dead. So first off, if anyone's not familiar with the Goonies or Night of Living Dead, well, maybe they won't be interested in this. But if they're not familiar with Goonies, they understand kids. And if they're not familiar with Night of Living Dead, they understand zombies. So I've made it generic. I've sort of set up the genre, even though there's not, it's not a huge genre. There's not a lot of other, I've seen a other, few other people do something similar. You know, this is, Sort of original, I guess. But anyway, so, I, you know, Kids vs. Zombies, Goonies meets Night Living Dead. That puts it out there right on Front Street. So hopefully that's going to hook people and have them wanting more. And that's where as much as you want your initial two sentences or whatever to be very brief, uh, you want to be able to expand on that. So if somebody is interested, like, oh, that sounds cool, then you can go into a little more. And, you know, you kind of go in increments, but have different size or different length uh, sort of synopsis. If you've got somebody that's super interested and just keeps wanting more, then you can go as far as you want without, obviously without spoilers or whatever. But you want to know where to go from there. You want to have your initial real quick, grab them like that, and then you can go on if they're, if they're interested. If they're not, then you can move on. Now, after I hook somebody with that comparison, Goonies meets Night of Living Dead, all that stuff, I get them interested, then I can go a little deeper and I've got my sort of standard elevator pitch. My standard elevator pitch for Young and the Dead, after I've hooked them, is just to go into that, that quick two sentence, tweetable log line. And that's something like, 11 year old Sam Young and his little brother Tad team up with a band of neighborhood misfits to uncover the cure for a deadly zombie outbreak and save the world before it's too late. So uh, that kind of sums up more or less, there's a lot, again, there's a lot of other stuff going on in my story, but it's not as important and I can go into that later. But what I've done is I've established some important things. Uh, now I did mention the name of my character and the reason why I do that is because the title of my book is Young and the Dead. It's kind of got a double meaning. They're, they're kids, they're younger, uh, but it's also the name of my main character. So that's why I threw that in, but I could just as easily said, instead of 11 year old Sam Young and his little brother Tad, I could, I could have said two brothers and it would have been the same. Now, I could have added a descriptor. I could have said, I, I guess sometimes I'll say like uh, an average 11 year old boy. Now, average may not sound like something you would say to get people on board with your character, like, oh, he's just an average kid. But in some ways, to me, Throwing an average kid in a situation like this with these the zombies, I think that creates an interesting dynamic. And the other thing is, sometimes, especially with younger audiences, they want to be able to imprint themselves onto a character. So if it's sort of a nondescript character, they can do that. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I do that. But like I said, I could just have easily said two brothers. I also mentioned that they team up with a band of neighborhood misfits, and that's important because I want to show that this is a team book, that it's an ensemble cast of kids, and that these aren't your you know, popular kids. These are just sort of from here, there, just regular sort of misfits. 
I talk about the zombie outbreak. That obviously is the, the crux of the story, the major obstacle. You want to present that. What is the obstacle? What do our characters have to face? And the other thing I've done is I've introduced sort of a, a ticking time bomb or you know an urgency to my story uh, before the time runs out. Because there's an element in my story that I've introduced that if they don't do this in a certain amount of time, uh, it's all over. So that kind of you know, creates that sense of urgency. And hopefully if you do your elevator pitch, your log line, if you do it well, you're gonna get people interested. They're gonna to wanna to know more. They're gonna to wanna to flip through your books. If you have a book already, if it's a story you're pitching, they're gonna maybe wanna know more. If you're just submitting sort of a sample script, you know, they, they may like that script. They may say, oh, that's a really good idea. We don't have anything like that right now that we're looking to publish, but we really like your, your thinking or whatever. It, it could go any number of ways, but you gotta get people involved. You gotta get people interested. You gotta pull them in and really that's what pitching is all about. So that's pretty much all I have to say about pitching. If you have any other tactics or things that you use to pitch, any other interesting ways to get people interested, let me know in the comments section. But other than that, that's going to do it for another issue of Making Comics 101. I'll see you guys later and that is all. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like what you saw and you want to see more, hit that subscribe button. Also, you can follow me at Cirkworks on social media, and now you can support the work that I do on Patreon. Do you like making comics? Then go to Cirkworks.com and pick up the Comic Maker Starter Kit. It's packed full of fonts, brushes, templates, and more. And best of all, it's totally free.